Hi, I'm Dr. Billy Wu, and in this video, we'll be talking about how we can make materials stronger through the way we process them. This follows on from two previous videos where we discussed equilibrium phase diagrams and steels. So if you haven't checked these out, please do. So first of all, let's explore why this is important. In previous videos, we explored how the mechanical properties of materials vary depending on their composition and resulting equilibrium microstructures. However, in many cases, the manufacturing conditions are actually under non-equilibrium conditions. Here, factors such as the cooling rate dramatically affect the resulting mechanical properties of a material. One example is in sword making, where we might want to increase the strength of the metal by quenching this in water after we've heated and formed the sword. In another example, we might have a gear where we want the teeth to have extremely high hardness and wear resistance, but have a ductile core. Here, we might use approaches such as induction heating to selectively heat a region and then rapidly cool this to have a hard outer shell, but also ductile center. In both of these cases though, we're looking at non-equilibrium processes and having a detailed understanding of what's actually going on will help us to better select appropriate materials and their manufacturing processes. So, at a high level, there are three approaches for strengthening a material that we'll cover in this video. The first is solid solution hardening, where we alloy a material with an impurity. The second is strain hardening or cold working, where we plastically deform a material to enhance its strength. And finally, precipitation hardening, where we form a second well dispersed and small phase in a material through specific heat treatment processes. So let's start with solid solution hardening. Now, in nearly all cases, high purity metals are softer than their alloys, and increasing the amount of impurities increases their tensile and yield strengths, which you can see in the nickel copper alloy example. The reason for this increase in strength is due to the impurities in the material impeding the movement of dislocations. In crystalline materials, a dislocation is a linear defect in the material and the ability for these dislocations to move is strongly correlated to its mechanical properties. In terms of the type of impurities and their impacts, we can alloy in an element which is smaller than the host solvent atoms to create a tensile lattice strain. Alternatively, we can alloy the material with a solute which is larger than the host element, resulting in a compressive lattice strain. In both of these cases, the lattice strain makes it more difficult for these dislocations to move, which results in an increase in the strength. Now, beyond atomic level influences, the size of individual grains in a metal also has a strong influence on the mechanical properties. Again, this is related to the mobility of dislocations within the material, as these dislocations have to happen over these grain boundaries during plastic deformation. Therefore, grain boundaries act as a barrier to dislocation movement. A fine-grained material therefore tends to be harder and stronger as there's more resistance to dislocation movement. Processing conditions in particular have a strong influence on the size of these grains. Here, we can see for a metal alloy which has been annealed or heated at 550 degrees for one hour, has smaller grains than the same material which has been annealed for one hour at 650 degrees, as the higher temperatures allow for larger grains to develop. So clearly there's a relationship between the grain size and the mechanical properties, but how do we quantify this? One basic approach is to use the whole patch equation, which relates the yield strength of a material to a baseline constant yield stress value, sigma i, plus a contribution from a constant k divided by the square root of the average grain size. This helps us to get a basic understanding of the influence of grain size, but there's many other things going on. Now, previously we saw that we can control the grain size through controlling the processing temperature, but we can also do this by strain hardening or cold working the material, 
whereby it becomes stronger through plastic deformation. This effect can be seen with steel, brass and copper. Here we can define the degree of plastic deformation by the amount of cold working which we take as the difference between the cross-sectional area before and after deforming the metal over the original area. However, whilst the strength of a material increases, this often comes at the cost of decreased ductility, so a balance between these two properties needs to be made. In terms of what's going on, strain hardening increases the dislocation density, therefore making it harder to deform the material as there's more dislocations per unit volume and also the grains have become smaller, providing additional barriers to their movement. Finally, we have precipitation hardening as a means of strengthening a material. Here, a small and uniformly dispersed phase is formed in the original phase, which again has the impact of impeding dislocation movement and therefore increasing the strength of the material. This can be achieved by specific heat treatment processes, which allow for non-thermodynamic or metastable structures to exist. For precipitation hardening, this is achieved in two stages. Solution heat treatment, where a supersaturated single phase is created by quenching a material rapidly. And a precipitation heat treatment phase, where the material is reheated to allow for the formation of small dispersions of a second phase. Now, let's have a closer look at what's actually going on in this process. Here, let's take the example of a silver copper alloy, which has limited solid solubility as shown in the phase diagram. If we select a low silver composition and heat the material up to a temperature of T0, which is the single phase alpha region, we have a homogeneous and single phase material. If we then rapidly cool the material from T0 to T1, we enter into the alpha plus beta region. However, because we've cooled the material so fast, this doesn't give enough time for the atoms to diffuse to their thermodynamically preferred position. And as such, we end up with a supersaturated alpha phase where the beta phase hasn't had time to precipitate out yet. Now, in the next stage, we have the precipitation heat treatment process. Here, the supersaturated alpha is heated to T2, which is still in the alpha plus beta region, but at the higher temperature, diffusion happens faster and the beta particles can start to form more rapidly. After holding the material at T2 for a set amount of time, it's then cooled to lock in the structure. And at this point, the cooling rates are less important, but doing so faster allows for the desired structure to be locked in. Now, at this stage, the material's microstructure consists of grains of alpha with small precipitates of beta. And given that this is a metastable state, there's often significant lattice strains and the small precipitates help to further impede dislocation movement and therefore this increases the strength of the material. However, if the heat treatment process is not properly controlled, we can lose the beneficial strengthening properties now, we know strength and hardness increase is a function of temperature and time, which controls the precipitation of the highly dispersed and fine beta particles from the supersaturated alpha phase. However, if the material is heated for too long, the second phase keeps growing such that the thermodynamic structure is achieved, leading to a loss of the strength increase. This effect is called overaging and can happen at room temperature with some materials. Now, finally, let's look at different forms of low alloy steels, which are alloys of iron and carbon. We're interested in this system since steel is such a commonly used material. A detailed summary of steel was provided in another video, but let's quickly revisit this here. The eutectoid composition of steel at room temperature consists of lamellar-like structures of soft ferrite and hard cementite, which we call perlite which transformed from a gamma austenite phase. At high temperatures and relatively low carbon compositions, we have a single phase of austenite. As we cool the material down, we enter into a two-phase austenite and ferrite region.
And finally, as we continue to cool, we enter into a two-phase ferrite plus cementite region, where the remaining austenite has transformed into perlite, which is held together by proeutectoid ferrite. Here, equilibrium transformations are driven by the diffusion of atoms. However, if the rate of cooling is too fast, then the carbon atoms don't have enough time to reach their thermodynamically stable locations, resulting in the formation of other structures or phases. Now, if we start to look at how different heat treatments affect the structure of steel, we see that we can form various non-equilibrium phases. When we do full annealing of the steel, which is a very slow furnace cooling, this leads to the formation of coarse perlite. If we then cool this slightly faster through a normalizing process, which is faster air cooling, we still form perlite, but with a finer structure. Then, if we cool even faster, say with forced air cooling, we form an even finer structure of ferrite and cementite, which we call bainite. Finally, if we quench the material in water, which cools it down very rapidly, giving no time for the carbon to diffuse, we form a metastable face-centered cubic phase, which we call martensite, which is extremely hard and brittle. Now, in reality, martensite is too brittle to be used in most applications, so by tempering or reheating the material, we can form tempered martensite to restore some degree of ductility. So evidently, heat treatments involve non-equilibrium processes and are used to alter the microstructure to achieve the desired properties. But how do we quantify the rates of cooling and the resultant microstructures a bit more? Well, in this case, we can use the Time Temperature Transformation Diagram, or TTT, plot. Here, we have temperature on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Now, for the iron carbon TTT plot, we have a few features to note. First of all, we have the eutectoid temperature, where above this line, we have a stable austenite phase, and below the line, we have a unstable austenite phase. We then have several contours, which represent the point at which perlite starts to form, and when this is finished to have 100% perlite. At the bottom, we also see the point at which martensite starts to form. Now, if we have a slow cooling process, which is represented by a line with a shallow gradient, we can see we end up into the complete ferrite plus cementite region, where we form coarse perlite. As we increase the rate of cooling, we gradually form fine perlite. And then bainite, which has extremely thin ferrite and cementite regions. And finally, if we quench the hot steel, we rapidly cool the material such that it never enters into the perlite region and instead forms martensite. Therefore, these TTT diagrams are useful for understanding the non-equilibrium structures which form from different cooling rates. So, to summarize, material properties clearly vary significantly with both composition and processing conditions. In the case of solid solution hardening, we alloy a material with impurities which introduces lattice strains which impede dislocation movement. Grain boundaries also hinder this dislocation movement, and if we decrease the size of these grains through processes such as strain hardening or cold working, we can decrease the grain size and increase the dislocation density to increase the strength. Thirdly, we can use precipitation hardening to form a highly dispersed second phase, which again hinders dislocation movement. This is achieved through a two-stage heat treatment process, whereby we first perform a solid solution heat treatment to create a supersaturated material. Then we reheat this material to form the second phase of precipitates. However, if this heating process occurs for too long, then the grains keep growing and eventually the equilibrium microstructure is achieved again and therefore we lose the strength improvements of the small uh, particulates. In the case of steel, the strength is very sensitive to the heat treatment process where depending on the cooling rate, structures such as coarse and fine perlite, bainite, martensite and tempered martensite can form. And finally, we looked at how we can quantify and map out the influence of these cooling rates and resultant microstructures using the time temperature transformation plots.
or TTT diagrams. So thank you for listening and hopefully this video has been a useful introduction into how we can make materials stronger through processes such as alloying, cold working and heat treatments. Again, this video follows on from previous videos on equilibrium phase diagrams and steels. So if any of these concepts weren't clear, please do check them out.